Next, we have Brian Cleary, who I'm not sure what he's going to talk about yet until I receive the title. And we'll have to guess from there. That's better. Um, so I'm coming from MIT and the Broad Institute, and what I'm going to talk about today is a sort of new conceptual framework that we've been developing, an experimental framework as well, um, for studying biological systems in general. This is inspired by some ideas that come from the world of applied mathematics and statistical learning theory, um, in particular an idea called compressed sensing, but it's related to other things as well. But just as a way of introduction, there's a lot of uh, analysis that happens um, in genomics and molecular biology in general that's essentially taking high dimensional data and looking for underlying patterns um, that reflect the biology of the system. So I'm showing here two examples of other projects that I've worked on uh, that do this sort of thing that actually relate to some of the things that we've heard about <clears throat> earlier in the week. So, um, one of the problems is actually in metagenomics, and in metagenomics, this actually relates to sort of one of the first slides that we saw uh, from Ben's talk, except that instead of trying to deconvolve different clones, we have a mixture of sequencing data from unknown microbial genomes. But again, the problem is that we have unknown mixtures of unknown genomes, and we're trying to deconvolve these into individual clones. Um, so this is a related problem, but again, you have very high dimensional data where you have a massive amount of sequencing space and you're looking for here covariance patterns across many different samples that are indicative of sequencing reads that came from the same genome. So we developed a method that scales to like terabytes of data and are able to resolve genomes uh, or clones, if you like, that are present at very low or vanishing frequencies, even like 10 to the minus fourth relative abundance. Um, in another more recent project, we've looked at a developmental time course, in this case of IPS reprogramming, using single-cell RNA-seq. So what we did was we took fibroblasts and reprogrammed them using the factors mentioned in the previous talk to induce pluripotent stem cells. And we profiled them every 6 to 12 hours with single-cell uh, RNA-seq. So we did about 300,000 different cells. We were able to identify many different cell types that emerged throughout this process. And we developed a new mathematical technique based on an idea called optimal transport to infer the ancestors and descendants of any given cell type that arises throughout the process. But anyway, the, so these are both um, have some related applications to studying tumor biology. This is a developmental time course and understanding the evolution of different cell types that emerges throughout the process. And here this is related to finding clones in mixed sequencing data. But really the reason I point this out, again, is to um, bring up examples where we had very high dimensional data, we look for patterns that reflect latent underlying structure. That's very common. What I'm actually going to talk about today is a new idea that's based on the premise that that can always be done, essentially, that there's always latent structure that exists. And the question is, can we come up with new ways to collect data much more efficiently given that this latent structure exists. So we wrote a paper um, describing how one might do that for gene expression profiling last fall uh, using something called composite measurements. I'll describe that in a second. And we have a lot of ongoing work that's applying this sort of theoretical work in the lab to, for example, increase multiplexing capabilities for spatial profiling or to make gene expression profiling more efficient in general and also to understand um, genetic interactions and to understand the effects of genetic perturbations. So I'll talk about this first and then the actual examples that we have going on. Um, and then at the end, if I have time, I'll also get to um, how we can apply the same mathematical ideas to study evolution. Okay, but first, just some motivating examples in tumor biology. Uh, one thing after we get sort of the initial technology development out of the way that we're very interested in applying these to um, is to do spatial profiling in tumor samples, um, either for protein or mRNA abundance. But in particular for protein abundance, we're kind of limited right now on the number of channels that we can measure simultaneously. Um, so if you're sort of good at immunofluorescence, you can maybe measure six proteins simultaneously. There are methods now that can do multiple cycles where you can strip off and then restain in a second round of cycling, uh, of imaging. 
And the question is, can we massively increase that multiplexing capability? Is it possible, for example, to profile all of the antibodies that we have in the world that work, which maybe there's 500 or 700, in a given tumor sample using a small number of measurements? So we'd like to do that, um, collect, say, tens of images, maybe 40 images, but then resolve the spatial uh, abundance patterns of, say, 500 different proteins. Another thing that we'd be interested in understanding are the effects of sort of interactions between mutations. And this is basically an entirely unexplored problem, not in the sense that no one's ever, you know, studied a genetic interaction, but in the sense that the space of possible interactions to study is massive, and it is impossible to exhaustively test for the interaction between every pair of mutations, not only that exist uh, in uh, tumor samples, but just in the genome, human genome in general. So we, there's massive amounts of variation that exists in the human genome. You know, there's maybe 20 million common variants, and in any person's genome, we have about 4 million mutations compared to the reference genome. So that's a lot of potential interactions that exist. Uh, specifically, it's about 10 to the 4 million potential interactions. So, you know, there's not enough cells on the planet. We're about 10 to the 4 million off from having enough cells. So even if we got to take every single cell on the planet and use it to test a different genetic interaction, we wouldn't have enough cells. So we need sort of new conceptual paradigms in order to even come close to be able to understand, you know, what are all the different possible interactions between mutations. And then it's only more complicated in tumors because you're taking that and then layering a bunch of mutations on top of it. So I'll talk about how we can use some of the same math uh, to approach this problem. And then, as I mentioned at the end, uh, very quickly, stealing a figure from one of Nikki's paper, um, how we can use, again, the same sort of ideas to understand evolutionary processes. Okay, so overall, the goal of this work is to combine a lot of knowledge that we have about biology and genetics with some cool new methods that have been developed in mathematics, specifically related to learning with random features and an idea of compressed sensing, uh, to make our ability to learn about biological systems sort of exponentially greater for certain classes of problems. So just to summarize the things that I'm about to go over at sort of an abstract level, um, there's a few things that I want to get across. First is that um, in a lot of cases, we can actually learn just by doing random experiments and making random measurements. So really the point is that you just need to collect information from your system, and as long as you're collecting with each measurement or each experiment a little bit of different information, in many cases, it doesn't matter how you design that. You don't have to know anything about your system in advance. You just need to collect information, you know, in sort of orthogonal directions, and you can design these randomly and still figure out what's going on. So that's something that's not usually appreciated, though, for example, Ava tried to bring it up um, with the sort of random features that could be, could be used to uh, distinguish different signatures and so on. Um, but as specific applications of those, if we are interested, for example, in finding which perturbations or mutations result in a similar outcome, we could just make a small number of random measurements under each perturbation and be able to classify them or cluster them. And similarly, if we were interested in finding which genes might be co-regulated by similar pathways, um, we could do a small number of random experiments and figure that out. Moreover, we could actually decompress this sort of small number of random things to actually learn the results of all the high-dimensional individual things. I realize that's rather abstract at this point, so we can get into some actual results. And these ideas, as I said, come from other fields uh, originally, um, and compressed sensing in particular has been applied a lot in image processing. So many people know that images um, are highly compressible. So this is a picture of one of my dogs with very muddy paws. And the original photo is something like eight megapixels. So when you snap it on your iPhone, the amount of data collected is, uh, in this case, about 24 megabytes. But the phone doesn't store all 24 megabytes. It sort of immediately compresses it down to something that's about 100 times smaller. Okay, so you only save about 1% of the data in a compressed format, but then when you decompress it, the image looks almost exactly the same as the original high-dimensional format. 
And the reason that's possible is because images are highly structured. The color and intensity of each pixel in the image does not vary independently from all other pixels in the image. So this sort of um, feature of natural images has been leveraged, of course, to store things very efficiently, but it turns out you can also analyze data directly in a compressed format, and so algorithms might run much faster. So instead of do running your algorithms on, say, a database of images that are this size, you could run your algorithms on a database of things that are 100 times smaller. So you might, for example, compute similarity between images based on their compressed representation, and that's a good approximation to their similarity in high dimensional space. And what I'm particularly interested in is that if you know that the images you're going to be capturing are compressible, um, you can actually acquire the data directly in a compressed format. This is used, for example, in MRI. So instead of paying to acquire this much data, but then only storing this much data, you can actually just acquire this much and then decompress it up to the high dimensional representation when you're ready to view it. So for things like biology, where it might be extremely expensive to go test 10 to the 4 million <clears throat> genetic interactions, this might be extremely useful. So here's how we'd like to apply that in general. Uh, for gene expression profiling in particular, imagine first that you have a big matrix of gene expression. So in this case, we have one column per sample and one row per gene. In general, of course, we can decompose those sort of matrices in all sorts of ways into a much lower dimensional representation. So for example, suppose I decompose this into what I'll call a module dictionary, where I've got one column per gene module and a set of module activity levels. I might be able to represent any given sample by the sum of a very small number of gene modules. So I could represent this gene expression profile by the activity of these three modules shown in green here. So that's a very low dimensional representation and pretty much we can always do this. We can capture a lot of the information that exists in gene expression profiles with a very low dimensional representation. Okay, so they're compressible. That's just another way of saying they're compressible. So instead of representing a sample in 20,000 dimensional space, in this case, we're representing it in just three dimensions. It's a union of subspaces, but anyway. Um, so we went from 20,000 to three, or whatever, that many to three. So they're compressible, so the question is how can we actually, or what is the general scheme for leveraging that to collect data in a compressed format, and how would we decompress it? Here's the cartoon of what's going to happen. Imagine that we have a bunch of samples in the lab, and we'd like to do something to profile their gene expression levels. For each sample, we're gonna collect a small amount of data. We're gonna use that data to learn which gene modules were active in every sample. And then if you know the definition of the gene modules, you can just multiply these matrices out and get an approximation of the full gene expression profiles that you didn't actually measure. So the goal is no longer to collect enough data to learn 20,000 numbers, but now I merely need to collect enough data to learn which three modules were active in every sample. And at a very basic level, because three is a very small number, you only need to collect a very small amount of data, right? We're trying to learn three parameters in the cartoon, so I need to collect something that's bigger than three number of measurements. Yeah. Sometimes. I'll show you when you don't need that actually also. Yeah, you, this. You need the module dictionary first. Yep. That's right. So um, in some of the examples I'll show, we'll use training data to learn the gene modules. And then suppose we have new samples and we're going to apply the same set of gene modules but we don't know which modules are active in any given sample. So the question is, what data do we need to collect in order to learn which of our gene modules are active in these new samples? Okay? And, and I'll talk about how, how well it generalizes to um, new data sets and what you can do if you don't have any trading data at all. 
Okay, so what does it actually mean to collect um, compressed data for gene expression in particular? Um, well, instead of uh, measuring the abundance of actual genes, what I want to measure are the abundance of composite genes. And mathematically, a composite gene is simply a linear combination of gene abundances. So for example, composite gene one might just be a weighted sum of 20,000 gene expression levels, okay? So that would be composite gene one. Uh, and we might have M total composite genes, so maybe M is something like 100. Um, anyway, M being much smaller than the total number of genes, which here I'm saying is 20,000. So that's it. Mathematically, it's fairly simple. Um, there's a question of how do we actually choose the weights? And um, this is where I come back to the point about being able to do random measurements. So you could try to be very smart and make these weights correspond to different biological pathways or if you like different principal components. So you could think about having composite gene number one be like a measure of the activity of the first principal component. That would be a fine thing to do, but it's also not necessary. It turns out you can pick these randomly, um, not totally randomly, but under certain random distributions. And um, those perform almost as well in sort of these decompression tasks as if you had picked them optimally. So that's pretty cool because you don't need to know anything about your system um, in order to design your measurements. So if you create a measurement panel, for example, you can apply it to new systems because random for one set of uh, samples that you're gonna measure is also random for another. Right, so how conceptually we would apply this, one way is that we'd like to make fewer measurements to get the same amount of information. So for example, with uh, RNA-seq, normally what we do is we separately quantify the abundance of 20,000 genes, um, and here I'd like to quantify the abundance of 200 composite genes, so this presumably under certain uh, molecular schemes requires a lot less work. But we could also think about making the same number of measurements and getting more information. So I mentioned at the beginning an example with um, multiplexing, say, immunofluorescence. The same sort of idea can be applied to, for example, mass cytometry, mass cytometry based measurements. Um, where you're limited based on the number of channels. I don't know if you know how CYTOF works, but basically you have a fixed number of channels um, that correspond to different heavy metal isotopes that are conjugated to antibodies. So you shoot these into a mass spec, and each heavy metal isotope abundance is a proxy for the abundance of a particular protein target. But there's a fixed number of channels because they can only resolve uh, so many different mass spectra. So um, theoretically, they'd like to go up to about 100 different channels, and the way that that's normally imagined is that each channel would correspond to one different protein target. We would like those to correspond to 100 composite measurements, uh, and roughly speaking, if we could do that, if we had the antibodies for it, we think we could go from 100 measurements to infer the abundance of about 10,000 different proteins. Um, we don't have good antibodies for 10,000 different proteins, but we do, as I said, have good antibodies for about 500 different proteins in the world. So there we could probably make about 40 measurements and hope to learn the spatial abundance patterns of um, 500 different things. Uh, we can also ask, what does a compressed experiment look like? So those were compressed measurements that I showed on previous slides. A compressed experiment tells you um, the average result of multiple independent experiments. So just like a composite measurement, told you the average result uh, or net uh, abundance of multiple genes. A composite experiment tells you the average outcome of multiple individual experiments. So for example, it might tell you the average outcome if you were doing genetic perturbation experiment and you were in total, let's say, perturbing 100 different genes and then measuring outcome, could be fitness, could be RNA, whatever. A composite experiment might, for example, tell you the average outcome of a random subset of 10 of those experiments. So you wouldn't know the outcome of any one individually, but you'd know the average outcome of all 10 of them together. And the idea, generally speaking, is that if we know the average outcome of one random sub subset and then the average outcome of another random subset, each time we're doing that, we're learning a little bit of different information about the system. 
And using all that together, we can kind of infer all of the different uh, uh, pathways and things that exist. Okay, so those are the sort of conceptual ideas and overview of how it is that we might actually um, collect compressed data in the lab. So what are some actual applications? Um, as I was just mentioning, suppose I was doing a large panel of perturbations. So this might be testing for um, the effect of creating different mutations, or this might be testing for the effect of different drugs on a particular cell population. And suppose I wanted to know um, which of those perturbations results in similar outcomes. And I'm gonna do that um, at least with existing technology with RNA-seq. So I'm gonna do all these different perturbation experiments and each time I'm gonna measure RNA-seq profiles and then I'm gonna cluster the experiments based on all that data I collected. The alternative way with composite genes is that again we set up those experiments but instead of uh, collecting these information on 20,000 different gene abundances each time, I could collect just 100 randomly defined composite genes. And then it turns out, if I cluster the experiments based on this vector of length 100, it's a very good approximation to the clustering that I would get based on um, each sample having a vector of length 20,000. And this is, actually comes from a very general uh, theorem from applied mathematics called the johnson lindenstrauss lemma. And in this case, it doesn't even really depend on any structure that exists in biological systems. But we've done, we've shown um, that this holds, nonetheless, in biology in a number of different applications. Um, this particular example comes from looking at the GTEx data. So this was, uh, the data set here is about 8,500 different RNA-seq samples derived from different tissues in different individuals. So the first thing we did was we took those 8,500 samples and we clustered them into 30 groups based on all 20,000 gene abundance levels. So we have one um, pie chart per cluster with the colors corresponding to the tissue of origin of a given sample. So all this is meant to convey is that things tend to cluster by tissue of origin, which is perhaps unsurprising. Um, we're also going to add a little bit of noise to that because this is done through, um, we're simulating the process of composite measurements, so I'm adding noise to simulate um, measurement noise. Anyway, if you just take 20,000 gene levels and noise them up, you pretty much get the same clusters back out with a few exceptions. Um, but then we can ask, suppose I made 100 random noisy composite gene measurements and then clustered based on that, so if you cluster the 8,500 samples based on 100 random simulated composite measurements, again, you get back out um, pretty much the same clustering. And the differences between the original data, um, in this case, are actually not due to lof loss of information from um, compression, but actually just the loss of information that happens from adding noise to the data. Yep. So the question is how did we actually, uh, what's, what's sort of the definition of a random measurement here? How did we select them? Um, so each measurement is, is defined by 20,000 random weights. So we just choose a vector of length 20,000 that are all random numbers. And then we compute a weighted average of a gene expression profile in a given sample from those numbers. That's right, and we do that 100 times. So now we have, for each sample, we have a vector of length 100, and then we cluster based on that. Um, but then there's a question, so that's just, um, so it turns out that clustering is kind of an easy problem because to cluster things, you need to know about the distances between them, the similarity, but you don't need to know about the details. You don't need to know any of their specific numbers, for example. So in general, clustering can be done with a lot less information, it's a much lower dimensional problem, um, than actually knowing the high dimensional values. So the, the question, the next question is, could we take these um, composite measurements, a small number of composite measurements, and actually go back and learn what all the 20,000 um, individual gene expression values were? So this cartoon I kind of already went over, 
here's how we did this in our um, sort of first computational and theoretical paper. Um, for any given data set, we would randomly take 5% of samples in a data set. So by data set, I mean like GTEx or all the samples in TCGA or something like that. Um, and we would compute a factorization of a gene expression matrix like this. And that's meant to give us this sort of module dictionary. Then we would do, as I described before, on the remaining 95% of samples in the data set, um, we would simulate a small number of composite measurements, use those composite measurements to learn the module activity levels, and then infer um, what the gene expression profiles must have been. And then finally compare the approximated data with the original data that we didn't actually observe. So here's some examples where we were taking 5,000 genes chosen at random, um, simulating just 25 random measurements. So this is a 200-fold compression. And based on these 25 random measurements, trying to estimate what the unobserved 5,000 gene expression levels must have been. Um, these are the results looking at Spearman correlation for a number of different data sets. For example, in GTEx, on average across simulation trials, the uh, approximated gene expression levels are about 82% Spearman correlated with the true abundances that were not observed. Yep. High dimensional data. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and the signal to noise ratio is about two. So it's a decent amount of noise. Now, an important question that was brought up before is, do we actually need to go through this step of having training data? In some situations, especially for primary samples, it might be very difficult to get training data. So in general, it'd be super cool if we didn't have to have it. Um, on the previous slide, we were using just 5% of samples. Here, we'd like to ask, if we didn't have any training data at all, could we do the same thing? Uh, we developed an algorithm uh, called Blind Compressed Sensing, SMAF. This is a particular type of decomposition that we did. And you can actually go through the same process where you're kind of learning the gene modules purely from the compressed data that you collected. You can't compress quite as much. So here we collected 20 times fewer, we simulated 20 times fewer composite measurements than there are genes. Um, but running through this algorithm, you still get a decent approximation to all of the individual high dimensional values. Uh, even having never observed a gene expression profile before. So this is pretty cool. This says that um, if you've literally never seen a gene expression profile before, so you don't have any knowledge of specific co-expression patterns, but you know that it's true that co-expression patterns exist, purely based on that knowledge, you could collect a small amount of data, and that's sufficient to infer the co-expression patterns, and then from there um, to do basically what we did on the previous slide. Yep. Um, it, yeah, so this case is parametric. You can pick um, some sort of, here what we specifically set are the total number of modules that exist and um, an upper limit on the number of modules that are active in any given sample. But those are, that's just because the decomposition algorithm that we developed is parametric like that. It's not formally a requirement. The only thing that's really formally a requirement is that there's a small number of modules active in any given sample. Okay, so um, here's some actual applications. We have um, a number of different applications of this idea going on now in the lab. I mentioned that one we're very interested in is for spatial profiling. And we're interested in spatial profiling both of transcript abundances and of protein abundances. Um, so this is just a um, uh, sort of computational example to show that the idea should generally work. So um, what we did was we have um, painstakingly generated, or our collaborators in this case, have generated images for 13 different um, protein targets, okay? So this is hard to do. They go through multiple rounds of imaging and um, most labs generally can't, aren't set up to do this. And even for this lab, it's quite difficult to do. What we did was we said, Suppose we only wanted to have used six different channels. So here they had 13 uh, fluorescent channels, actually through two rounds of cycling. Um, we wanted to say, what if we only had six available? Could we use these ideas? 
of compressed sensing and composite measurements to infer um, those original 13 images. So we said, suppose that we made these sort of simple compositions with just binary weights. So in this case, composite measurement number one would correspond to taking antibodies for this set of genes and just conjugating them to the same fluorophore. So if you do that, you're gonna get an image that looks like a hot mess, almost like you just measured many things simultaneously in the same image, because that's what you did. So we simulate this by taking the images for these genes and just merging them together. Uh, and then similarly, for five more measurements, you're gonna take different compositions of genes um, and take antibodies for all those, conjugate it to, in this case, the dye number six, and create that image. So the input to the algorithm are six images that look like a mess, and then based on co-expression patterns, um, we inferred these images over here, which were very um, good approximations to the original images that our algorithm didn't see. So we're actually in the lab doing this now. Here's the general workflow of how this goes. For training data in this case, what we do is we collect single cell RNA-seq from matched tissue, and in the single cell RNA-seq, we learn the gene modules. We also simulate the process of doing compressed sensing to find measurement compositions that generally perform well in that tissue. Then we actually create those measurement panels. We go back to the region of interest, um, generate the composite images, recover the gene module activities, and decompress to get the larger number of individual images. So specifically, the numbers we're working with right now, we have one project looking at uh, protein profiling. We're going to uh, generate seven composite images and decompress that to get images for 19 individual targets. We're also doing this with transcriptome profiling. We're gonna generate 10 composite images in that case and decompress um, to get about 37 individual targets. And generally, this scaling here is almost exponential. So that's why I say, when you can get from 10 up to 40, you can actually resolve hundreds of targets. Yep. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so the weights, we just use, in this case, for simplicity, we can actually use binary weights. So the proportions don't, you just, it's just either in or it's not in. Um, and those, if you could use like normally distributed weights, they work a little bit better than like sparse binary weights. Um, but you know, I don't know how to measure negative abundance of something. And also then, yeah, you have to control the specific proportions and everything else. Okay. Um, so quickly, now moving on to how to apply the same mathematical ideas to um, understand perturbations and be more efficient about how we do perturbations. Um, I already mentioned this before, but there's uh, tons and tons of variation that exists in the human genome. Um, usually what we do is we try and observe some genotypes and uh, create a model that explains phenotypes. Um, and pretty much there's never any uh, effects that are attributed to epistasis but we don't really know if that's true. It's just because our models are not powered to detect epistatic effects, as I said, because there's so many potential interactions and we only get to observe so many examples. Um, so basically, oh wow, that didn't work. Um, so basically we, we have no statistical evidence for epistasis, um, but if you talk to anyone, a molecular biologist, you know, epistasis, epistasis is the norm. Things depend on other things, always, 100% of the time. So epistasis definitely exists, but genetically speaking, in GWAS studies and the like, we have no evidence that it, it exists. Um, so something is missing, okay? Um, so we'd like to apply this sort of new conceptual way of thinking about the problem uh, using, as I mentioned before, I'll skip this, um, composite perturbations. And here's basically the idea for why this is possible. So suppose we're studying a signaling pathway, for example. And we're interested in the transcriptional response to some sig signaling stimulus, okay? I might represent uh, the transcriptional response of each gene in the genome as some function of all genes that might potentially be in the, in the pathway. We could use methods um, like perturb -seq or other related methods to 
knock out individual genes and measure the gene expression profile, but doing that exhaustively is not really possible because there's lots of genes, and as I said, if we're measuring, interested in measuring gene-gene interactions, there's too many of them. Um, but it turns out we might not have to. So for example, if I were to knock out this gene, um, a downstream transcriptional module might no longer be upregulated. Similarly, if I knocked out another gene in the same pathway, the same downstream transcriptional module might be dysregulated. So the outcome of these two experiments is highly correlated. And in general, across all perturbations that I might do, the number of canonical outcomes could be relatively small because there's a relatively small number of co-regulated sort of response modules. So now the problem, instead of trying to create a wiring diagram that goes from every gene or gene pair and draws an arrow to every 20,000 genes transcriptional response, the problem becomes how can we learn a small number of canonical outcomes and for each perturbation map it onto one of this small number of outcomes? And in particular, what sort of data should we generate to answer these questions? And it turns out we've done a lot of theoretical work to say, once again, you can generate these sort of random composite experiments in a small number of random composite experiments, just like a small number of random composite measurements can be used to learn sort of, um, in this case, the matrix is kind of transposed, but again, something like module or pathway activities. So I'm happy to discuss that a little bit more. We're doing this now where we're going to both do a massive number of individual perturbations, sort of the exhaustive way that you might normally do it, and also compare that with a compressive version of the same thing and ask for different compression ratios, how well can we actually recover the sort of true result from our big expensive experiment. Okay, and finally, I won't have time to go through this completely, the same sort of mathematics could be used to study evolutionary processes. So I don't actually have this one going on in the lab yet, um, but this is sort of just a toy example of how one might use the same ideas. Suppose that I was interested in evaluating some large number of genotypes in a large number of selective environments. This is interesting for many different problems, including for understanding tumor biology. One way that I might do that is to separately create each different selective environment and just go directly measure the fitness of every genome in every environment. And if I did that, I might end up with big matrix. That's number of environments by number of genomes big. Um, and as before, this might be a very high dimensional space. And you can imagine that what we're actually going to do is to look for patterns in that very high dimensional matrix that can be represented in a low dimensional space. So again, just as before, if that's what we're going to end up doing, we don't actually have to go evaluate every genotype in every environment separately, but we can sort of evaluate either in composite environments or evaluate composite genotypes. So that's the very short end of the story. Um, mathematically speaking, what we're actually, what we actually might do here is for example, one interesting feature of this matrix might be the principal eigenvector of either uh, selective environments or of genotypes. And it turns out that <clears throat> in sort of a low dimensional space, so if we um, take this big matrix X and project it down into something that's logarithmically smaller, the principal eigenvector in this matrix is a good approximation to the principal eigenvector of this matrix. And there's sort of a good experimental scheme that we've developed for how to actually do this. So now you can, um, for exponentially less cost, evaluate certain characteristics of this sort of big evolutionary experiment. Okay, so that's not explained completely because I'm roughly out of time and because I'm not actually doing it yet. Here's some cartoons for so how do we go about it. Um, the big exhaustive experiment uh, involves setting up E different experiments, that's the number of selective environments, and then you have to measure the abundance of all G genomes in each of E environments. Um, and the method that we're proposing costs basically the log of E times a certain number of time steps, 
is the number of experiments that you have to set up, and in each one you measure the abundance of G different genotypes. So it's roughly um, exponentially more efficient in terms of cost. All right, so just to summarize, um, the, the sort of framework that we're proposing here is that we can rethink about problems as um, being about collecting enough data to reconstruct the sort of structured latent variables that exist in a system. Um, this can often be done about exponentially um, uh, more efficient than doing it exhaustively. Um, and we can apply that to get more information from the same number of measurements, um, like in spatial profiling, or to get the same amount of information from a much smaller number of experiments. Um, so I'd like to thank uh, my PhD advisors for this, who are Eric Lander and Aviv Regev, um, different people in the lab, and thank you for listening. sensing with completely random data. But my understanding of the Johnson Linden stress is that you do potentially have this logarithmic, you know, the log E cost over a, an optimal solution you could create with an oracle. So I was wondering, in practice, what is the actual gap there? Because that may be appreciable in terms of experimental costs. And can you do more if you intelligently pick your vectors? Or is random really the right thing to do? Yeah. So that's a great question. Um, so just to restate the question, uh, what's kind of the difference between doing things optimally and just picking your measurements or experiments randomly? And the answer is, um, if you're doing a small number of measurements, it sort of matters a lot. So for example, when I was talking about the spatial profiling, I said that we collect training data from the same tissue, and we simulate if we used um, different compositions, randomly chosen, many different times, um, how well would they perform in that particular tissue? And there it makes a big difference that if you just pick one at random, that can have dramatically different performance from picking um, the optimal one, or even if it's not the optimal one, you know, one that um, performed the best across your simulations. And that's because, again, you have a relatively small amount of information that you're collecting, you're only making like 10 measurements. But if you're making, say, 100 measurements, there the gap decreases quite a bit. And the difference between sort of the optimal performance and the random performance is much less noticeable. So that's roughly how we're thinking about the problem. So that's why I say in the spatial measurements, we'll try to optimize a little bit for kind of the co-expression patterns that exist in whatever sample we happen to be measuring. But when we go to study, for example, genetic perturbations, where I'd like to um, study, let's say, a million different genetic interactions from, uh, let's say, 500 different experiments. There, I'm doing, I'm collecting information from 500 things, and so it's okay that I can just do that randomly. And that's nice because experimentally, randomly just means I just pipette a small number of cells into each well, and that's random. I don't even have to know what, in the, what went into each well. One of the advantages that many people have cited about the large sort of experimental data sets that we get is that uh, suppose some other researcher wants to find out about one detail of one particular experiment that's been done and find out the, you know, the values that they have. Um, and I understand that if you're doing these, this work, you can sort of find, do the deconvolution to get that, you know, that, that practically you can do that with this mechanism. But for an individual researcher who's coming to look at the data set, it may be hard for them to access these tools to do that. So I'm just wondering, have you thought much about how to make it possible for people to remine these data sets to access individual parts that they're interested in that are not the same question that's being asked at the initial uh, get-go? Yeah, it's a great question. So I think that definitely is one of the downsides, is it, it, especially if you're asking sort of an idiosyncratic question or you're asking about an idiosyncratic effect. So um, one example of those is looking for cis EQTLs, okay? So suppose we did a bunch of perturbation experiments and had a bunch of data and someone wanted to come back after the fact and look for cis EQTLs. 
the effects of cis EQTLs are just local. There's no sort of modularity involved. You know, they, they affect sort of one gene nearby. They, it's not like they have a broad effect um, in cis space across a thousand different genes. So there are certain applications that this is definitely not good for. Um, one thing where they could be used to sort of remine the data is um, just for doing this sort of similarity analysis. So I mentioned that you could cluster data based on random measurements, and that you could sort of remine because that's sort of model independent. You don't, it doesn't matter how we learned our gene modules or anything else, it's, that's purely possible because um, the geometry of data in high dimensional space is preserved approximately in the low dimensional space. So you could go remine for similarity between things in a way that doesn't depend on anything about how we modeled the data. Hello. Related to uh, Russell's question a little bit is, um, so of course biological networks have non-random topologies to them and so with um, certain hub uh, features or density in terms of uh, degree, no degree in a, in a biological network. Uh, and so one could anticipate that um, the certain genes, for example, certain proteins will have much larger effects in terms of epistatic interactions um, than others. And so I wonder if there's, um, so in, in addition to random or optimal, computationally optimal, is there, is, are there biological priors that you can induce into your system to, uh, to, to even um, be more efficient in terms yeah. of your experimental design? Yeah, it's a great question. The one that we've um, been dealing with more directly is um, when we're doing protein or uh, uh, mRNA expression profiling, um, we might introduce priors on sort of the average expression of a gene. So for example, especially when we do protein profiling, when we mix all these antibodies together, if we mix an antibody for a very highly expressed housekeeping gene, um, that might saturate the signal and will be relatively insensitive to, say, a lowly expressed transcription factor. So there, what we might do is just introduce a prior and basically normalize out the signal for what we expect the average expression to be. Um, and there's different molecular tricks that we have to do that. And you could imagine doing the same thing in perturbation space, exactly as you described, for things that are more likely to have many interactions. I'm a, a strong supporter of modularizing the expression space. There have been numerous attempts over the last, I don't know, 15 years or so. Also, I think your two supervisors brought out various, number, uh, I think, modularizations based on different data sets. Like, for example, the connectivity map data sets where, where the L1000 assay was then established based on 1000 genes that sh should somehow reflect or be a compressed uh, representation of, of the expression uh, space in the, let's say, compound perturbation uh, um, uh, experiment space. Yeah. So, how, how does, so you now focus on a new technology development which is or method development which is highly appreciated but does that also mean that let's say um, there are there's a reservation with regard to the quality of the modules that were for example also uh, come up with uh, in, in the in the uh, l1000 essays and so on and do you want to extrapolate let's say the use of your modules uh, to other applications than, let's say, predicting, uh, um, let's say, tissue expression, because I think then it becomes problematic. Yeah? So what has been shown over the years, also, at, again, at the Broad Institute, yeah, with the M6DB a collection of transcription modules that uh, carefully and, and uh, carefully selected modules based on investigation of multiple data sets are probably superior. So, yeah. Yeah, so those are all great points. There's multiple things there. So um, we're very aware of um, the problems in sort of generalizability of these things. And um, there's a couple things that, you know, we try to do, um, as you say, there's can be issues with generalizing the L1000 model to new samples. So a lot of that profiling was done 
on highly available, accessible, proliferative cell lines. And so generalizing that to example for primary samples is very difficult to do. So there's, there's two things that we actually did um, to try and help with that problem. One is that there they're picking a thousand genes that are determined based on their training data and measuring those. And so that's why we kind of emphasize here that you could actually pick your measurements randomly and here's a scheme that could use the random measurements. So um, at least in terms of the measurement design, there's no bias that comes from training data. So they should work just as well on primary samples as they should on highly proliferative cell lines. The other thing specifically related to the gene modules, um, that's why we developed the blind compressed sensing algorithm, is to say, suppose you don't want to be biased at all by prior training data, could you still be more efficient and leverage the fact that in your new samples, the modular expression profiles definitely exist, but you don't know what they are yet. Um, but in general, I don't necessarily envision the application as being someone takes the gene modules that we find in a certain training data set and then applies them elsewhere. I envision it more like how I presented um, our workflow for doing the spatial profiling, where you actually get a little bit of training data in your sample of interest, which we're doing through single cell RNA-seq, and then you use that training data to find the modules and then decompress um, straight from there. Uh, so, so I had uh, one question. I, I really like the idea of uh, using latent structures and biological data and decompression. It really appeals to the mathematician in me. And so I, I sort of had an idea and I wonder what you thought of it. Uh, you know, humans are also very highly correlated in our genetics. So instead of uh, perhaps doing a genetic study where we sequence the whole genome and all three billion base pairs of the human genome, uh, say we, you know, randomize individuals into, you know, those with a disease and those without and measure, say, a half million positions in the genome and then, you know, decompress that to, to, to find the genetic variants associated with the disease. Would, would that uh, strategy sort of fall into this framework and how would that work, play yeah. out? Yeah, I mean, um, I'm super interested in, in general how you could apply this to doing genetics, both in terms of being more efficient about how you genotype different groups, um, and in particular, in bringing some notion of pathways and things into doing genetics. That's the main thing that is entirely absent from genetics right now, at least at the point of doing association testing. But, but what I just described was, was the paradigm for doing GWAS. Uh, where we took 500,000 SNPs and we genotyped individuals and we found, you know, common variants that were associated with disease. And actually things seem to be going in reverse, even at the Broad, where from, you know, 500,000 common SNPs, we've gone to exome sequencing and now full genome sequencing because of these long tail phenomena that we often observe in genetics. Similarly in, in, in cancer sequencing, where instead of panels, we went to exomes and now we're going to whole genomes and finding increasingly rare variants that are of, of high effect. So it seems like perhaps the, the, the paradigm isn't as generally applicable to, to all systems in biology, that there are always going to be these long tail phenomena that we need to explore some more systematically. No, I, I think it's definitely true that there is a long tail in genetics of unexplored sort of rare variants of big effect. Um, but I think it's also an open question of how much effect comes from, if you like, rare combinations of common variants. That's an entirely unexplored question, as I said, because we're simply unpowered with the current analytical frameworks and the way that we collect the data. So it's just, those are ignored. It's clear that if we collect more samples the way we're doing it now, we'll find more rare variants, and as we do that, we find more rare variants of big effect. But the, the other thing we're just not looking for at all. So um, I think there's opportunities for, for both things to sort of contribute to the field. All right, we've gone out a while. It's just, just a simple question. Uh, what you do sounds awfully like machine learning, like looking at the data without any prior assumptions. You know, biology may add to the model, but it's not necessary. Um, there's a lot of active development right now in image processing. That's the example we started with. Uh, have you tried using any of the new developments in image processing, like uh, deep neural networks or uh, similar methods to this kind of data? Yeah, yeah, it's a great question. So the examples that I went through here are all sort of linear representations of the gene modules and things. Um, and, but you could do it also if you have a nonlinear model. So compressed sensing works if you have sort of a, a nonlinear generative model. Um, so for example, suppose you have some big neural network and it goes down to a skinny layer. Uh, 
the goal then would be to use the data that you collect to learn the activity levels of the nodes at the skinny layer and then just run it forward from there and get the output. So it can be applied to those settings as well. Okay, well let's thank Brian again. And